Today we have Colleen Cruz presenting on Writers Read Better, the writing reading connection. Colleen is the author, if we can go to the next slide here, Colleen is the author of several titles for teachers, including The Unstoppable Writing Teacher, as well as the author of the young adult novel, Border Crossing, a Tomas Rivera Mexican-American Children's Book Award finalist. Most recently, Colleen authored Writers Read Better Nonfiction, which published last summer, and Writers Read Better Narrative, which will be out next week. Colleen was a classroom teacher in general education and inclusive settings before joining the Teachers College Reading and Writing Project, where as Director of Innovation, she shares her passion for accessibility, 21st century learning, and social justice. In today's webinar, Colleen will share with us the best way to capitalize on that reading-writing relationship and establish a healthy reciprocity that effectively and efficiently develops students' literacy skills. I, for one, am eager to get started, so Colleen, I'll turn it over to you. Yay. Hi, everybody. So excited that you're joining us today. Um, I have a quick question, Dina. Am I running the slides, or are you and Jeff? Yes, you are. Okay, great. Yay, I have some power. Um, so everybody, <laughs> we were having some, some internet issues. I don't know, everybody's on Netflix in Brooklyn today, but uh, so that's why we don't have video. But know that, that my face is smiling right now because I'm super excited to be talking about um, writing and reading and writing and reading connections uh, this afternoon or this evening, depending on where you're calling from. Um, so just a quick note, I love questions. Uh, so if you have questions for me throughout, uh, please type them in so I can field them. There's going to be a couple of times as we go through this webinar where I'm going to ask you to think about something. If you're sitting with a friend, you could talk about it with them. I'm going to ask you a couple of times to jot or read something. And if you would like to put a response into the chat box or uh, field a question for me, I would love to hear from you. So without further ado, let's just talk a little bit about uh, why this topic is so near and dear to my heart, so near and dear to my heart that I have written not one, but two books, one that's about to come out in a few short weeks uh, about this notion of how writers read better. Uh, and actually, there might be more books to come because it's, it's become sort of a semi-obsession of mine. So all of this sort of started uh, a few years ago when I was, um, actually a lot more than a few years ago, uh, when the very first Harry Potter book came out. Uh, at the time, I was one of the only people I knew that was reading it. I frequented a bookstore here in New York that did imports. And so there was a, you know, I was a teacher, I read lots of children's books. And there was this new book called Harry Potter. And I dressed up as Harry Potter that year for Halloween and no one knew who I was, which is super funny to think about now. Uh, and I remember when my friends eventually caught on to books, I was so excited to talk about them because as soon as we found out that this was not going to be just one book, but several books, we all started making predictions. And one of the things that I remember talking about with my friends was, you know, what's a real bummer to me is obviously, you know, Dumbledore is one of my favorite characters. And it's unfortunate that by the end of, of all of the books, he's going to have to die. And my friends were like, oh, what are you talking about? How could that be? What are you talking about? And I made that prediction, not because I'm a jerk and a spoiler, because obviously those books <laughs> hadn't been written yet. Um, but it was because I knew a lot from my life as a writer at the time I was working on a novel for young adults. And I was super aware of just the notion of if you create a character and you've said that they need to complete something independently, then they have to be the strongest and best positioned person to do it. And in the case of Harry Potter, Dumbledore was the strongest wizard. There's no way that Harry Potter could have beat Dumbledore, could have beat Voldemort if, if Dumbledore was still around. So he had to go. Not to mention that his name was Dumbledore, which is a Britishism for Bumblebee. And we all know that what happens to Bumblebee is if they sting once. Uh, but all of that knowledge wasn't for me being a voracious reader, although I really am a, a pretty big reader. It's more from my life as a writer. And when you create characters, when you create plots, when you create settings, 
you're really better positioned to read them stronger. And as a teacher and later as a consultant, as a staff developer for the Reading and Writing Project, it was something I started experimenting with with students where if I found them getting stuck in something with reading and I would teach them strategies and practices, um, if they still kept getting stuck, I would sort of flip the script a little bit and see if they had an active writing life, how I could tap that writing life to help them with their reading life. And so this has been sort of my go-to strategy every time I'm working with a kid who I feel like could use some extra support. And what makes it kind of interesting, or at least makes it interesting to me, is I grew up, and one of my mentors is, is Katie Wood Ray, who wrote the amazing professional development text, uh, Wondrous Words. If you don't own that yet, you need to get it immediately. And she is the first person that I ever learned from who taught me about how reading like a writer is a thing that can help us learn craft, um, plot, structure, and that writers can learn how to write better by being great readers. So that was, that was an incredible thought for me. And it's something I think many of us know to do. You know, if we're going to teach poetry writing, we get our kids to read lots and lots of poetry before we do it. If we want them to write articles, we have them read lots and lots of articles. And that is 100% true and really, really powerful. But sometimes we forget about the flip side, which is how writing can really support reading. So I started digging into this a little bit to see if there was any research on this topic. And actually, there's been tons of research on this topic. It goes back decades and decades. Some of the first research that was done um, was by a man named Donald Graves. Many of you know him. I sort of refer to him as the godfather of the writing workshop or one of the godfathers. Uh, and he was one of the first researchers on this connection. But since there's just been piles and piles of research on it, and my favorite um, is one from uh, Graham and Hebert from the Carnegie Foundation's uh, study that came out in 2010. And what that study said is that students' reading skills and comprehension are improved by learning the skills and processes that go into creating a text. Specifically, when teachers teach the process of writing, text structures for writing, paragraph or sentence construction skills, those improve reading comprehension. When we teach spelling and sentence construction skills, those improve sentence fluency. And when we teach spelling skills, those improve word reading skills. And they had, in, by the way, this is a really great study to dig your teeth into if you um, our research helm like I am. You can easily Google Graham and Hebert 2010 Carnegie Foundational Pop Write Up. It's very compelling research about how writing is, yes, of course, important for writing's sake. And of course, writing is important. You know, we talk about written response. Of course, that's important as well. But the most important thing for me, or the most compelling piece from this whole study, notion that if we want stronger readers, we have to teach writing. That writing is one of the quickest and most powerful and effective paths to creating stronger readers. And this is something I would argue that um, primary people have known for years. I don't know how many primary people are out there um, right now, but you know from watching kids that kids learn often to write before they ever learn how to read. I have a kindergartner right now and I'm watching him slowly learn how to decode. And one of the things I watch him do all the time is make signs around the house and write words and letters that he knows. And then anything he writes, I know he can read. So I'm going to ask you right now, I'm going to show you a video of a student. Um, writing a, a first grader and I'm going to ask you to look at this video clip and note and that's the writing sample that he's working on. I'm not going to show you the whole clip. I'm going to show you some of it and think about what does he know as a writer that will support him as a reader. My name is Sam. I
O A A A What's the word you're trying to spell, honey? Excited. Excited. A A I mean C. X Excited. Mm -hmm. You want you go down to the next line so you can go start Excited. fresh. Mm -hmm. uh, uh. What's the word you're trying to spell? About. So about? About? About. About my What's the word you're trying to spell? Lie? Lie. Okay, I'm going to pause the video right there. So, what he is writing, in case you're not entirely able to read it, is I am so excited about my library and it is closed. So some of the things that we see him doing as a writer is some of you are noticing he knows some sight words like am and I and so and my and 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 it. And so those are words that we would expect if he was reading, he'd be able to read. We were also noticing there is this idea that different words um, have different spaces and then certain things like it is closed, he sort of sees all as one word, they, there's no spaces there. So there's some ways in which if I was, he was reading, I, I'd be curious to hear if he would divide individual words up or if he'd see them all in the trunk. He also sees, you know, different um, fonts like well, obviously library is a really big important word and so that is bigger and that might be something that he notices as a reader so just taking a look at this and, and those of you who are primary teachers are probably nodding your head wherever you are we know that when when our kids are writing we're getting lots and lots of insights of what they can do as readers and so um, it's, it's something that's always been important, but I think it's become extra important nowadays as we move into this digital and media age where kids are, um, and all of us actually, are inundated with tons and tons of media, information, and articles, and opinions, and entertainment. And it's a lot to make your way through, and being able to be critical about that is really crucial and important. And so whether it's entertainment for, you know, sitting with a bowl of popcorn or if it's something more serious, like whether or not vaccinations are a good choice. Um, you know, right now here in Brooklyn, we're having a measles outbreak. So it's definitely something that is very close to home, this idea that people are um, having a hard time critically reading research to know about health choices. Um, but then there's some things that feel a little bit more lighthearted, like the flat earthers. <laughs> it's a flat earth society. And there are people who truly, truly think that there is scientific evidence that the earth is flat. And so these are little things that are sort of like funny, but also a little bit horrifying if you're an educator. Um, and and you think, what is the best way uh, to teach students how to interact with things like Fortnite when um, I'm also still working on things like main idea and, and theme? Like, how do we pull that together? And I would argue, what we're going to argue about, or I'm going to argue today, we're not going to argue, you might argue with me at home, but <laughs> um, I would argue that the, the 
one of the biggest tools we have at our disposal is having a healthy uh, writing workshop or a healthy writing space in our classrooms that kids are writing all the time so that they can then take those writing skills and apply it to read it. Very much like Katie Ray taught us years ago that seamstresses look at the clothes in a clothing shop different than those of us who don't sew. Um, it's also true, the reverse is also true, that if we, if we, re, if we, um, if we're in a store, we're also going to be more likely to think about what we did at home, and is this something that we can do, and are we going to be fooled by this cheaper material? Um, are we going to be fooled by this particular button choice? So what I want to have us um, think a little bit about is those reciprocal skills, and something that I included in the first book and I'm including in the second book as well is just a sort of cheat sheet of some of those reciprocal skills to help us uh, get quickly to hello can I interrupt you for one second the, the, yeah. um, the images aren't displaying very well I think it's a bandwidth issue could we maybe okay. ask Jeff to take over the slideshow sure. and then you just let him know in advance I think that would present better thank you sure Okay, Jeff, why don't you go ahead? Do you want me to stop Slide sharing? Seven. Yeah, sorry, everybody. We just want to make it a better experience. There we go. That looks much better. Thank you. Okay. All right, Jeff's on it now? Yes. Okay, great. So, um, so this is this uh, solutions at a glance piece is taking a look at something that you'd want your kids to work on in reading. Um, say, for example, you want your students that are text structure. And then you would think about, well, before I have them look at it as readers, is there something or maybe I already have had them look at it as readers. Is there something else I could do to make this more concrete? And one way we could do this is to then teach them a lesson first in writing. And yes, we're the writing lesson to improve their writing, but in the back of our mind, we also have a little bit of an ulterior motive. And that is we're also teaching this writing lesson in order to help them with something in reading. So for the text structure thing, if I know that my students are having a hard time identifying text structure, then what I'm going to do is I'm going to teach them a lesson in writing, maybe something like revising the arc to match the meaning. So I teach them in their writing work that they can go back and look at their story arcs, their story plans, and they could revise them to make sure that they match whatever ideas or messages or themes that they're trying to get across. And then in reading, if not that day, maybe the next week, maybe weeks from now, I would then teach them how, hey, remember how you revised your arc to match the meaning of your story? Well, guess what? When you're reading stories, there's authors behind them who created story shapes in order to connect to the meaning of their stories. So could you pull out your story arc? And let's just talk about that for a second. What, what were some choices that you made? And now let's look at the book that you're reading and sort of make that connection for them. Or we might look at something like inference, say, who doesn't struggle with inference? It is a tricky thing to teach. And so if I know that that's something that my kids sometimes need a little bit of bolstering, I might say, teach them something about how the narrator's voice makes perspective clear um, and how they can use their voice to make whatever it is that the author is interested in more clear to their readers. And then whatever moves they used, whether it was like a sarcastic voice or a gentle voice, whatever voice they used helped make their perspective clear as an author. And now I could have them look when they're reading to see what are those voice moves? Can they identify as ways that um, the writer that they're reading does the same thing? Let's look at the next page. Jeff, there we go. Um, we could look at, say, 
strategy flexibility. Sometimes our students really struggle with going from thing to thing as readers. Um, sometimes they just stick, uh, today I'm just predicting. But if we want them to be able to do more than one thing, we might look at something like, especially let's say you're doing digital reading and writing, which I think is one of those places that feels like uncharted territory. Um, our students sometimes just jump into a digital text and don't spend a whole lot of time thinking about it. Well, then I might, in writing, spend some fair amount of time teaching them to choose the best platform for their story, whether they're going to do like a, um, you know, a web comic or an infographic or a multimodal type text. And then in reading, I would want to show them that, you know what, this really fun web comic that you're reading or this really engrossing article that you're reading with all the videos and stuff like that, the person who wrote this made the same choices that you did and they created um, a platform or they're using a platform that would get their point across. So let's take a look at why you chose what you did and see if that helps you and understand why this author chose what this author did. So with that in mind, I want us to think, just kind of underline the point that when kids are taught how to purposely write text, they are really well positioned to read critically. All of that work that we're doing in writing is absolutely valuable for writing's sake and our kids are gonna be stronger because of all the work that we're doing in writing. But one of the really beautiful things about mindfully, carefully doing this work is that we're also getting more bang for our buck. Every writing lesson that we're teaching, we're actually teaching reading as well. And one could argue the reverse is true. So what I'd like us to do is to, to try some of this together. We're gonna, we're gonna try a little writing and reading together. I'm gonna try three different sort of big ticket strategies, paired strategies, um, or skills together. And um, I'm gonna hope that wherever you are, whether you're in a classroom or at home, that you're gonna, you're gonna play along with me and try some of this stuff together. All right, Jeff, let's try the next one. So we're gonna start with thinking about weight in writing. And weight in writing is how much space something takes on the page. So if something is really, really important to you as a writer, it, if something's really important to you as a writer, you are going to make sure that um, out of your 30 pages, it's not gonna just be one. Like if you're writing a story about the time you got in a fight with your best friend, what you're absolutely not gonna do <laughs> is you're not gonna say, and then we got in a fight at the end. You're gonna make sure that that fight takes up a lot of space. So the same thing is true when you're working on nonfiction as well. Um, you're gonna wanna make sure if you're really trying to say that sharks are not that dangerous, that you shouldn't just have one page at the end of your book that says that, that the whole book should have some sort of, or a lot of the book should have some sort of indication of that. The flip side of this is also true, the determining importance in reading, sometimes it's really, really hard for kids to know what's the most important thing. They often get distracted by the most interesting thing or most exciting thing. Um, but when you're thinking about, um, really thinking about reading deeply in, in nonfiction, you want to figure out what is important and what can we sort of uh, set aside. So let's try this with writing first. Go to the next slide. So go to the next slide. There we go. So in writing, we teach students things like, well, maybe you don't do this, but I teach kids to kill your darlings. That's a Dorothy Parker quote. You might be less violent than I am. That's that idea that if something you sometimes we get so enamored with our own writing that we get caught up in sort of like purple prose and we go on and on and on about something, but it's not really that important. So sometimes writers need to go back and kill things that we really love, but aren't really that important. We also in writing teach kids that 
we want them to write more about the parts of your topic that matter the most to you. Sometimes people call that stretching the heart. And then we also teach them how to use setups and transitions to signal what's important. Like we'll say, but the most important thing is, or no matter what other people say, the thing that I say, and we, we sort of signal those things as being more or less important. Now, if you look at this chart, and I'm, I'm a big fan of the T chart for writing, reading reciprocity. Um, I've gotten obsessed now, if I'm gonna do a writing chart with making sure that I'm somehow gonna connect it to reading. So lately I've been playing with um, them being on the same chart in a T chart, but I could also imagine you using sentence strips or sticky notes to cover up words that are writing specific and change them into reading or vice versa. But in this case, you see the T chart. So the reciprocal skill of killing your darlings is consider what is missing. So if the darlings aren't there, then as a reader and you're reading about sharks, what do you notice is missing? Maybe what you notice is missing is no mention of shark attacks. Or if you're reading about space, maybe you notice what's missing is there's no mention of aliens. And so you go, hmm, maybe that's not so important, even though that's why I came to this book. If you look about the right, more about the parts of your topic that matter most to you, the reading reciprocal is noticing what takes up the most room on the page. So what's the biggest chapter? What's the biggest section? And then finally, paying attention to signaling language becomes this idea of when kids do this as writers, I think sometimes they think they're doing it like brushing their teeth. I don't think they always know why transition words and setups are important. But if we have them really focus on it as reading or writing and have them like actually underline, like for example, one time, the most important thing, however, have them annotate why they use those words, why those were the transition words they use, and then have them have those drafts out on their table while they're reading. And then when they're reading their nonfiction books, oh, look, Seymour Simon is using that exact same work. Oh, look at this. I can't believe how Melissa Stewart is saying more than anybody. Um, and so those are all things that we might be thinking about. So I thought it'd be interesting to take a look at a piece of student work where a student, this is a student in Carrie Hook's fifth grade class here in New York City. And she wrote a piece that I love. It's one of my favorite pieces of all time called Cashin's Fashion Law. And we're gonna take a look at her draft and we're gonna see um, some of what, um, some of what she did at the beginning and then what her teacher taught her. All right, so let's take a look at her first draft of her table of contents. So if you look at that first draft of her table of contents, you will notice that, I mean, I'm sure you're noticing it right away, every single chapter is what? One page long, right? They're all exactly one page long. And when's the last time that any of us have um, read a book in nonfiction where every single chapter is one page long. It's not. Some are two pages, some are 20 pages. I'm reading a book right now that um, one chapter was five pages and the next chapter was 30 because things change because whatever matters to the writer is going to take up more space. So let's see um, how Fiona's writing looked after her teacher helped her and talked about weight. So this is her next table of contents and you'll notice that some things grew quite a bit and some things stayed the same. So we've got um, Cashin's Fashion Start is two pages, Skills is three pages, Upcycling is two pages, and then a bunch that are just one or even different styles and having fun are probably about a half a page each. Let's look at how she ended up. Whoa, so big change now. Upcycling has gained quite a few pages. So it starts to spread out more as she gets, and this is by the way, her final um, published. So you can see that without even opening her book, we already know what matters the most to Fiona. 
Uh, upcycling is huge to her, followed in close second by her skills work and maybe um, the different styles. So let's just take a look at her upcycling chapter. And by the way, I, I love this, so I hope you love it as much as I do. You may have gone through your closet recently and thought, I need to go shopping. Now let me stop you right there. Are you sure the clothes you don't want can't be turned into something different? Well, maybe it can. This is called upcycling. Upcycling is when you take something old or even brand new and make it your own. Upcycling is like taking a broken toy and repairing it in a new way. To make it your own, you could... Go ahead, Jeff. Be so simple. Whoops, back one. <laughs> you can take your old white t-shirt and paint stripes on it. You could also take a pair of jeans and glue some pearls, rhinestones, or diamonds on it. At this point, by the way, I need to say <laughs> that uh, you might not need to upcycle if you are putting diamonds on your clothes. Anyway, then your old plain pair of jeans could become something and it won't cost you a penny. Upcycling is all about making your old clothes look new. Plus, having your own special touch. And then look at her little upcycling story. I don't know if you've been noticing the page numbers, by the way. Those are also amazing. These are earring page numbers. One day, I was having a play date with my friend and her mom was there. My friend and I were playing dress up when my friend's mom had a great idea. She would turn an old woman's skirt into a new dress for me. After a couple of pins put here and there, the old woman's skirt was now a one-of-a-kind dress for me. So you can see that Oh my gosh, she's really passionate um, about this notion of upcycling, so much so that she's got tons and tons um, of writing on it. So let's move on from here and let's look at some reading. So this is um, Melissa Stewart's book, Robots, and I'm just going to look at an excerpt of it. And I'd like us to look at her table of contents. And without reading the book, just looking at the table of contents, let's see what matters most for Melissa Stewart. So let's take a look, Jeff. So if we look at her table of contents, and remember what Fiona did, right? Um, and remember how some of her pages and her chapters were longer than others. Just take a quick scan. What seems most important to the author of this book, Melissa Stewart, in terms of robots? There's so much to say about robots, but what does she find um, most important? Oh, I see some, somebody from Winnipeg is here. Nice. Nature Knows Best. Brianna is saying Nature Knows Best looks like a really big chapter. Yeah. Um, what's a robot? Yes. What's a robot in Nature Knows Best is um, two really big ones. Robots at home. Mm -hmm. Another big one. And so looking at this, right, even before you read the book, I mean, honestly, I wouldn't say this exactly to kids, but I kind of might you could just read those chapters and you would absolutely get a big chunk of what matters most to Melissa Stewart in, in her book. Okay, let's move forward, Jeff. I'm just going to skip through the rest of this part because I think they're good. The rest of the robots. Advance a little bit. Okay, so let's talk about voice. Now, in my work um, with teachers all around um, and in my own work in the classroom, I know that one of the things I struggled a lot with in teaching reading was noticing voice of an author. I love teaching it in writing, but gosh, when it came to having my kids identify some particularly nonfiction, although it's also true of fiction, my kids just would say, well, that's just how it was written, like as if it had just dropped down from the sky, and that was how it was written. They did not see voice, and yet voice is so much fun to teach in writing, and so this was a place that I, I love to play a lot in teaching it first in writing and then looking at reading. So let's take a look at it in writing first. 
so in writing, when we're developing voice, some of the things, and I am sure as you're looking at this, that you probably have taught some of these exact same lessons to your students, right? As if you're talking to a friend or your mother or your principal, right? You're, you're teaching a persuasive writing unit and you're telling them to write as if you're talking to the mayor. Um, that's a really important thing. And of course, if you're writing to your best friend, that's gonna be a different voice than if you're writing to your principal or your boss or your grandmother. And that's the, the voice thing is about the language you use, the punctuation you use, all those things. Using the words that stand out to match your purpose. So if I'm talking to my mother, I'm going to say things like, Mom, how you doing? What's going on? If I'm talking to the Queen of England, I might have a, Madam, Your Majesty, how do you do? Right? Like there's just different ways that we talk when we talk to different people. It's even fun for kids to imagine one sentence from their writing piece, how they could revise it to match different purposes and different audiences. Then, of course, punctuation. I think the most interesting thing when it comes to punctuation is uh, teaching them how to use it to show mood. You know, sort of a matter of fact mood is periods and um, an excited mood is exclamation points and question marks and, and all of that sort of thing. All right, let's move forward. So let's take a look at this piece. This is um, from that same class, Carrie Hook's class, uh, fifth grade class. And this is a draft. Um, and what I love is that student, his teacher taught all these lessons. And so you can see exactly um, the footprints of Carrie's work as you look at this piece and identify his voice. Introduction, your brain. Your brain is you. Whenever you look at something, listen to something, smell something, taste something, or feel something, your brain is at work behind the scenes. Every time you move some muscle or joint, your brain is running backstage. When you remember a memory, the same thing happens. Now your brain controls your body. It may sound weird, like as if you're being taken over by some alien robot and you don't even know it, but it's true. Every day, idea you come up with derives from your brain. You think through your brain. Even as you are reading this book, your brain is separating the black ink from the white paper and processing what you see in black as words. Then it separates the words into letters and identifies the letters then with that information in the words. Your brain is always at work. Your brain is the most important and amazing part of your body since without it, people would be nothing more miraculous than celery sticks, which is just like my favorite line ever. Um, you can see his voice, right? You can see him talking to us. He's using the second person. He's very matter of fact with his periods and commas, not a lot of exclamation. Um, and he's telling us something that's really unbelievable. His word choice, uh, when he's talking about processing, information, um, very domain-specific language, but then he's also got humor, right? Celery sticks, that is super funny. So let's take a look at reading now. Let's flip forward a little bit. Jeff is going to move us to the next slide. And by the way, if you have a question, I'm, I'm keeping an eye on the chat, so feel free to throw it my way. Um, so this is my like new, well, it's not new, it's been out of a couple of years, but I love this book so much for many different reasons. Um, Two Truths and a Light is actually a part of a series where each chapter has three articles, two are true, one is a lie, and kids read to figure out which one is the lie, and at the end, they sort of reveal it. And so um, let's take a look, thinking of, of everything that we just saw that student do with his writing about brains, let's think if, if he could or if you could identify what Amy Joan Paquette and Laurie Ann Thompson do with their introduction. What are they doing for voice? Let's read it together. You should know something right up front. This book is sneaky. Everybody knows the way books normally work. If you pick up a work of fiction, you know that most of what you will read in between those covers is made up. It's a delicious creation straight from the imagination of the author. If you pick up a nonfiction book, 
then you can count on the contents being true and factual. But this book is not all fiction or all nonfiction. Instead, it's a bit of both. See? Sneaky. All around us, everywhere in the world, there are lies, but there are truths too. And sorting out one from the other is a really important and seriously interesting part of life. So here's the way this book works. Each section is broken down into chapters, and each chapter consists of three stories. If you've read the book's title, I bet you know where we're going with this. In every single chapter, two of the stories are 100% cross your heart and hope to die truths, and one of the stories is a complete fabrication, a lie. But which is which? Uh, that's where you come in. Even the lies might have kernels of buried truth, and some of the truths are so unbelievable they will scramble your brain. Your mission is to separate the two. So I see some of your writing is very conversational. It's got that you voice there. It's a little bit more excited than the student's piece because you see some exclamation points and dashes and question marks. But you see how there's definite um, focus on the punctuation to help lift it up. And the vocabulary, right? Lies, cross your heart, hope to die the language, fabrication, um, lots of language here that really goes with the subject. All right, so, so thinking about this, you can see how if a kid had really concentrated on writing their, with their own voice in mind and they had tried all those different moves, they would be super positioned to be able to identify how authors of the text that, that they were reading, um, how they use their voice. All right, so let's go forward, Jeff, to the next one. Do, do, do. Move on to the last one, which is message, I think. Keep going, one more. Do. Yep, so, re yeah. Actually, can you can go back one more. I'll just point that one out, too. <laughs> yeah. So just a quick mention. So you can see how the reciprocal skills go. If you're writing as if you're talking to a friend, you would read as if you're listening to a friend. If you use words that stand out to match your purpose, you would notice when words jump out. If you use punctuation to show move, then pay attention to how the punctuation makes you read. All right, so let's look at the last one we're gonna play with before we wrap up today, which is thinking about message. So we all know that developing messages in writing, developing that heart of your story, that lesson, that theme is so, so important. And we also know that in reading, oh my gosh, what, like, it can be really hard to figure out messages in reading. And so this is, this is, I'm giving you a sneak peek to the new book for those of you who are going to get the new book. Um, that this is one of the things I play a lot with is this idea of helping kids interpret, which I think is one of my Achilles heels as a reading teacher. And oh my gosh, it's so much fun. Oh, Michelle, I definitely want to spend some time looking at your question about the dry sense of humor. All right, so let's take a look um, first at developing messages in writing. So some ways we can develop messages. And I want all of you have your pens or laptops ready because I'm gonna ask you to take a minute to write a scene. And I'm gonna ask you to try one of these strategies. So one of the ways we can develop messages by including character action. So if my message is don't hurt people, maybe I'll have my character rescue an injured butterfly. Or maybe if I want to show violence is wrong, I'll have somebody punch a wall and break something that really matters to them. Showing character emotion is a way to show um, a message because the character's responses to something or lack of responses to something or I could be thinking about developing messages by repeating key images. If this is about love and peace, where I'm going to show um, sunshine or um, 
beautiful flowers or if I want to show something about friendship, maybe I'm going to show clasped hands or a shared pop tart or something like that. So repeating key images, phrases, or actions. And I could also elevate images, objects, and settings to become symbolic of bigger messages. So I could think about um, a big revelation that comes to my character and how the sun can come out from behind the clouds or the light that's been flickering suddenly gets steady. So what I'm going to ask you to do is I'm going to ask you to just spend one minute writing a quick scene or small moment. It could be a true one from your life, something that maybe happened to you today or this morning or something fictional. Don't overthink it because we're only going to take a minute. Um, but just take a minute to write a, a little scene where you're trying to develop a message. And the message doesn't have to be deep. It could be be kind to others or treat the environment well. But I'm just going to I'm going to be quiet for a minute and just ask you to write a scene. Take about three more seconds. Okay, what I'm going to ask you to do is to finish up the one that you're on, the sentence that you're on, and then I'm going to ask you to go through and just, can you just underline any places in your scene that you tried one of those strategies? You included character action or emotion or repeated key images or phrases or actions, anything that you did that you intentionally did to show your message. Got it? Okay. So now let's take a look at this piece of student writing. Um, this was written by a couple of kids in Doha in Qatar. Um, and, ooh, I love that so many people are sharing their writing right now. This is a kick. Um, so this is two kids that were writing this piece together, and they were trying to send a message um, by doing some of this work. Leo, time for Poochie's walk, shouted mom. Okay, but I better get some chocolate as an income, Leo replied. He grabbed Poochie's leash and attached it to the 300-pound dog. I better be back before dinner, Leo said to himself. I need to study. He opened the door, and just then Poochie took off. He must have forgotten to tighten the lead. Oh, curse word, he exclaimed, running as fast as his legs could carry him. He raced past the park, the bowling alley, the Papa John's in the corner, but he still didn't see him. Just then he saw a big shadow and thinking it was Poochie, started running towards it. However, as Leo got closer, it started looking more human with some sort of object. So we're looking at this and we are absolutely seeing a message of caution or... Um, I don't know, concern, worry, making a mistake, making a silly mistake with the dog and not fastening the leash. You shouldn't make mistakes. You should be more careful. And we're seeing this by the action, the dialogue, the images that we're seeing. Um, wow, some really great writing showing up on the, on the screen. So I'd like us to take what we noticed this kid doing and what we tried ourselves. And I'm going to actually have us look at a completely different text. This is a video text. Now, I want you to be prepared before you see this video text because the volume could be a little loud. Um, so you're going to look at this video text and you're going to see if you can identify the makers of this video's message. 
but you're not just going to look at anything. You're going to look at the thing that you did. So if you use character action or character emotion or repeated images, that's what I want you to watch for. Okay. So everybody go ahead and we're going to watch this video and see if we can figure out the message. We're not hearing the volume. Hmm. Is it possible to go back and try again to see if it was just a loading issue? Thanks for your patience, everybody. Let's try one more time. Well, you can definitely see a lot from the images, even if you can't hear the volume. <laughs> Jeff, could we try it again and see if we can get the volume? You did not hear that? Mm -mm. No. It was sort of like stop starty too. Hmm. Yes, let me try that again. All right. Yes, we have volume now. Got it. Are you getting the volume? Yep. It's a little quiet, it's, but we got it. It's low. Mm, paused. All right. So I will tell you, I will figure out a way to get you the link so you guys can see that video in its entirety. Um, got a little bit stop starty, but there are some definite things that you can see in there. Like hopefully, um, <laughs> um, hopefully you saw some character actions, mostly um, some perhaps some violent actions. If you were studying the, if you were able to study the characters' faces at all, you might have noticed. Yes, Becky, yes, the lighthearted whistle music. It definitely made it feel like violence is no big deal. Um, I don't know if anybody else was noticing the character emotions. Um, one of the things I found most interesting about it is that the characters didn't seem upset even though there was a lot of violence being wrought on the screen um yes that sort of cocky smile that that is a really good point um and there were things that were being done um following uh oh look at cj noticing the tears streaming down her face that matched the pelting raindrops um, no time left straight to violence. All of those things were, were right there. Um, what's <laughs> the characters kill each other and then floss afterwards. Yes. So when kids, 
write their own stories, they can see that they are creating messages and then they can see the messages that are being given to them, whether it's through video games or the stories that they're reading or the television shows that they're watching, they'll be able to identify um, those messages a little bit better. Okay, let's move on to the next slide, Jeff. So to, to get close to wrapping up, um, I would say some things you'll want to consider is to think about planning your year's curriculum. It's not always going to work that every unit that you teach or everything you teach in writing is going to match perfectly with everything you teach in reading or vice versa. So sometimes poetry will match perfectly with poetry reading, um, but sometimes it won't. And so consider the places where you know that reading could use a little bit of support and consider places where you could put writing to support that. And if you're thinking about writing, where could reading support writing and vice versa? But when it does work, it can be a really powerful thing. Another thing that you might consider is your classroom library. Um, how is it organized? Is there a way that you could highlight things that your kids are doing as writers that could then support them as readers? Like, could there be baskets of books that your students have written with certain moves and things that they've done that connect to the professional writers that they read? Could there be matched bookshelves like we see in local bookstores? If you like this, could we pair our kids writing with professionally published books? Could we have our kids even maybe paperclip some of their pieces to mentor texts and, and vice versa? And then of course, and you're always going to hear me say this if you spend any time learning with me, um, I really think it's important we work on our own writing. And when we write, that we get better at annotating the moves that we make as writers. And then we can then take that, our annotations of what we did as writers, and we can take that to our reading. And notice how our writing can lift our reading and then reflect. So if we can just flip forward to the question slide. Um, I don't know, um, that's just a quick sample of a, of a curriculum counter. You have to worry about. Um, oh, there's those things we removed. Um, I wanted to know if anybody had any last minute questions before we wrapped up. We got a little bit of a late start, so I don't mind hanging out for five minutes because we started five minutes late. If anybody has questions on any of this, um, I think it's important to include it. And also, by the way, right before the question slide, Jeff, if you can back up one while people are posting questions, I do want to let people know I'm super grateful if people um, do pre-order because it makes a huge difference. If you decide to pre-order, if you decide you want to get Writers Read Better or your school wants to get a copy um, and you want some book swag, if you send a copy of your receipt and the preferred mailing address to writersreadbetter at gmail.com, I will send you some book swag. Okay, so I see a question here from CJ. Is there a resource I could show teachers to help them expand their thinking or organization of classroom libraries. Um, there are a few really great resources. I've been spending a lot of time talking and thinking about libraries. Um, I think trying to decide, do you know, it would be easier? Or is there going to be a follow-up email to people or should I tweet it? What would be the best way to get resources out to people. Yeah, we will be sending an email out if that's the way you'd like to do it. We can certainly include that in the email. Yeah. That would be, yeah. I, I, what I'll do is I'll put together a little list of resources. I probably won't do it today, um, but I'll put a little list together of, of library resources and get that out to you. Um, Michelle's question about the child representing his or her personality in his or her writing. There's a couple of things. One of the things I would suggest is getting great mentor texts that show more of a dry personality or a dry sense of humor um, and using those mentor texts for that, that student. Um, like the boy in his Jaguar is a great one. Um, or there was a, a recent book about Temple Grandin that was really great that showed kind of her dry um, sense of humor that you might want to use. Um, 
somebody was talking about how would you suggest launching writing workshop at the beginning of the year with this reciprocity. I think the easiest way to do this, and this is discussed a little bit more in depth in the introductions of both of the books, but I would say one thing is just simply thinking about your charts <laughs> and like when you're setting up a writing chart or when you're setting up a reading chart that you're also thinking um, about how you can have that, that flip. So if I'm, maybe I start making any reciprocal units, um, T chart units. So that be, is clear to kids or just simply when I'm teaching a lesson saying, remember when we did this in writing or remember when we did this in reading um, and making that really clear. Um, I think I have time for one more question. Let me take a look. Some people were asking about um, actually, one of these questions is really easy. Does the book have suggested grades for the lessons? Um, we're recommending grades three through eight, but one of the piloting classes was actually a 10th grade class. Um, and I actually know some second grade teachers have been doing this work. So I think it really depends on your students. And the solutions at a glance chart is in the book and it refer every single lesson has a home in that chart and it will also be available in the downloadable resources that come with the book so if you want to like print that out or put it on a pdf so that you can carry it around with you when you're conferring um, that's an easy easy thing to do um, so any last things dina from the questions that are more for you um, no, I was just chatting back that, yes, we will be sending out an email to everyone who registered that will have a link to the recording as well as a copy of the presentation. And then the other links that we've said that we'll share will include in that also. Um, Jeff, if you could go back a couple to the where the books are shown. Um, we are um, at corwin.com is where you want to order the books because we give educators a 20% discount every day. So be sure to order the books there. Um, the newer one, the narrative, Writers Read Better Narrative, will be out next week so that you'll be the first to get it if you order it from Corwin.com. And the nonfiction is available already, so that will ship immediately. So I think that sounds great, Colleen. Um, really appreciate everyone's time and hope you have a wonderful Monday evening. Yay, thanks, everybody. Hope to see you all on Twitter land. <laughs>